Thank you very much, Dr. Duplichain. It's really an honor to be here. The Cosmetic Surgery Group is one of my favorite groups to uh, speak with. We've had a very nice relationship, and uh, I look forward to uh, giving this presentation. Uh, complications with uh, intravenous anesthesia since I haven't given a general anesthetic in uh, mm -hmm. many, many years. I've exclusively done intravenous sedation. I have a disclaimer that I have no financial relationship with processed EEG or electroencephalogram makers, the bispectral index, the sed line, and entropy. I will disclose that for 20 years and more than 4,000 patients, I used the bispectral index or BIS monitor. In terms of complications, Ben Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Now, I don't know if this is an obvious thing. I put Captain Obvious up there, but anesthesia is about medicating the brain. And Voltaire said, common sense is uncommon. For the life of me, I couldn't understand why the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation a newsletter chose to publish this article of mine in 2005 stating the obvious that the brain is the target organ for anesthesia. When you're engaged in measurement, you're practicing in a scientific fashion, which leads to reproducibility and minimizes complications. So this is the first textbook in the field, and it's the first textbook with a processed EEG monitor on the cover, and the first textbook to publish measured sedation levels. The second picture from the left, in case those of you don't recognize him, that's Joe Niamtu, one of my favorite cosmetic surgeons, who was very gracious and kind enough to commit uh, to writing a chapter for local anesthesia of the face. As you can see, the textbook is in three, three languages, which is pretty exciting. At any rate, here are, the, here are the numbers for biz levels. Awake is 98 to 100, minimally sedated 78 to 85, moderate 70 to 78, deep sedation 60 to 75, General anesthesia is considered 45 to 60 with systemic analgesia and over medication is below 45. Uh, I give moderate to deep sedation, titrating my patients to 60 to 75. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. The uh, thing to remember about anesthesia is there's two fundamental components, hypnosis and analgesia. And the processed EEG monitors only measure the hypnotic portion. Now, the shocker for me in the first five years, uh, when I tried to convince my surgeons to inject some more local anesthesia when the patient moved, is that vasoconstriction does not guarantee adequate analgesia. So I'm gonna show you with the, the brain monitor that uh, there's information, objective information that tells you whether or not the patient is getting to be awake or whether the patient is experiencing spinal cord uh, movement, which has nothing to do with awareness or recall. This bit of information took me an entire year from the end of 97 to 98 to figure this out. The number in the upper left-hand corner uh, is 43, and that's where the patient's hypnotic level was 15 to 30 seconds ago. And if you're trying to titrate propofol with this information, it's about as useful as trying to drive your car only looking in the rearview mirror. It's a lovely view of where you've been. It doesn't tell you where you're going. After a year out of frustration, the salesman said, well, why don't you try trending EMG as a secondary trace? And in the lower left-hand corner, you see two curves. The lower curve in orange or red is the trend of the electromyogram, which is every bit as real time as EKG. The problem for most of us with the upper left-hand corner is we're used to seeing information trend from left to right on the screens and we assume that we're looking at real-time information. It took me a long time to integrate the idea that the information is delayed 15 to 30 seconds. Well, that's just not very practical if you're in an operating room and you're trying to take care of the patient. So once you have the EMG signal, you now have a real-time piece of information that says, by the way, if you see those little spikes, that's the patient's way, the unconscious patient's way of saying, I'm about to wake up. Wouldn't you like to give me a little pro more propofol so I'll continue to stay awake? And the object is to titrate a little more propofol so the, the spike goes down to the baseline. And we're talking about the difference between using rear view mirror information versus front windshield view. 
people often ask me, well, gosh, Dr. Friedberg, how can you use that darn sensor with, with a right detectomy? That, that number three sensor is right in the, in the, front of the tragal incision mark. I said, well, this is how I modified the sensor and it works, the, the device works just as well. So the bonus with intravenous sedation is that neither propofol nor ketamine trigger malignant hyperthermia. And this is important because the initial diagnosis of malignant hyperthermia isn't the temperature going up, it's an unexplained tachycardia, which is frequently seen when you do local anesthetic injections because the epinephrine gets absorbed. So tachycardia in this case with propofol and ketamine sedation and hyperthermia. The extra bonus is there's no reason to, you don't have any reason to stock dantrolene because you're not using any triggering agents. So now we get to the meat of the matter. Here's a list of complications I decided to try talking about. Uh, airway issues, prolonged emergence and discharge, ketamine hallucinations, post-operative nausea and vomiting, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, lidocaine toxicity, and myocardial infarction. I'd like to comment at this time that Michael Jackson did not die from propofol. You frequently see this in the media. What he died from was a lack of airway monitoring. And as crazy as what Conrad Murray was doing, he could have easily used a baby monitor and been out in the hallway like he was, talking to his girlfriend in one ear, listening to Jackson breathe in the other when he didn't hear any more breathing, walk back in the room, lift his chin, and Jackson would still be alive. So, William Thompson, who was knighted Lord Kelvin, said, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. Opioid-free anesthesia is what I've actually practiced since 1992, and uh, this eliminates a major depressant of breathing, which is the opioids, and the opioids are also the number one cause. Friedberg's triad is what I hope the uh, history will remember me for, the nine words that nobody else has said in this context before, which is to measure the brain, preempt the pain, emetic drugs abstain. Now the airway. What causes the difficult airway? Usually, I mean, in cosmetic surgery, we're dealing with elective patients and they come to the operating room breathing spontaneously through open airways. And so what happens when people give boluses of propofol is it precipitously relaxes all of these airway muscles, starting with the genioglossus, the masseter, the temporalis, and orbicularis oris. So when you lose that muscle tone, you tend to lose the airway, plus the bolus of propofol depresses the drive to breathe. And eliminating the opioids, of course, is one less respiratory depressant. If you're only titrating propofol, you only have the single depressant to measure. So the first five years I was doing propofol ketamine, Again, the reason I was using no opioids is that two years before that, the surgeon I developed a technique for it had a death, in the, a fentanyl death. And I had done cases with him at the local uh, hospital, and he was only too happy to have me come and give anesthesia. He says, Barry, use whatever drugs you like, just no narcotics. So it's been opioid free from the get go. I didn't have an infusion pump, and I certainly didn't have a processed EEG monitor because the FDA didn't approve one until 1996. So basically I was using a, an IV bag in which I put uh, propofol and I diluted it once or twice or used it straight because there were three different types of, of patients. The fish had half strength propofol, the minnows had quarter strength propofol, and the whales who were really difficult to sedate got straight propofol. What was I trying to do? I was titrating incrementally to, uh, to maintain spontaneous ventilation on room air. Anything greater than 94, that was great. But somewhere between 94 and 96, you knew that there was enough sedation, depressant effect that you had effect on there. And the reason this was a big concern was that back in 1992, we knew that diazepam or other benzodiazepines block ketamine hallucinations, but it was completely unknown if propofol did the same thing. Here's the other issue. If you're not measuring, what are you going to do? Well, historically, we used body weight. We used heart rate and blood pressure. In Europe, they have targeted uh, computerized uh, infusions. And there's pro uh, <clears throat> PK is not propofol ketamine. In this case, it's uh, pharmacokinetics and PK is pharmacodynamics. BMI, of course, you know, is body 
mass index. So prior to the 1996 uh, approval of the biz, we always over-medicated everybody to make sure we didn't under-medicate. And that yet we wondered why did patients have prolonged emergence? In 1992, propofol was extremely expensive. It was 12 to $15 for a 20 cc ampule. And I was using an average of three ampules an hour for a four hour facelift was a, you know, a significant amount of money compared to other types of anesthesia. So I collected data uh, on three groups, zero, two, and four milligrams of midazolam for pre-medication, trying to figure out, well, if two milligrams is good, maybe four milligrams is better. If it's better, how much better? And the net effect was uh, in the 1999 publication was there was no difference. It didn't help at all. And so after July of, or June of 1997, I stopped using midazolam and only used uh, propofol. So I have a single respiratory depressant. Now we look on the left here, we have the bell curve that everybody's familiar with. And the average patient, of course, there's no average patients, but this is the curve, about 80% there. And on the low end, 10%, and on the high end, another 10%. We're going to show you somebody who's at one-tenth of 1% in a little bit. But this is how direct measurement is done. Uh, and the idea was to maintain spontaneous ventilation with a patent airway and eliminate delirium and prolonged emergence by only giving exactly what the patient needed. So most patients, I was able to titrate between 25 and 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute of propofol to get them to moderate to deep sedation at 60 to 75 biz. But sensitive patients, the patients who were really at the low end, point, <laughs> at one tenth of 1%, took as little as two micrograms per kilogram per minute and the really resistant patients take as much as 200 mics per kilo per minute. So you can see if you're not measuring, you're gonna have a tough time really being reproducible in your practice. So the 100 fold difference in propofol rate required for the same numerical level of sedation certainly means that you can be very much assured that you're always gonna have exactly the same anesthetic with exactly the same kind of very quick uh, emergence by using a, a processed EEG monitor. I published this in 2020 uh, in aesthetic plastic surgery. So basically, I'm here to tell you that brain monitoring, whatever device you want to use, is the 21st century standard of care. And this is my the web page, the home site of my self-funded nonprofit Goldilocks Foundation starting in 2009. Uh, and the tagline is no major surgery under anesthesia without a brain monitor. Again, we're talking about science and we're talking about reproducibility because there's great variability, tremendous variability in patient to patients. I uh, wrote this book for the general public and it's a free download from the, uh, from the uh, nonprofit foundation. In 2012, I was on the doctor's show and I was uh, at that point still trying to sell this, uh, this book. And uh, the doctor's show has uh, about half the viewership of uh, Dr. Oz. And it's viewed, uh, filmed in front of 200 uh, live audience and a viewing audience of 2 million. And I was hoping to see maybe 100 or 200 books published. I bought that that week and it turned out I, I, I sold six and the four more the following week. So I said, maybe the better part of Valor is to give this away because I never intended to make money out of it. I was just trying to help people uh, advocate for 21st century anesthesia. This is how I induce patients. This does not require a brain monitor, but if you wanna be uh, very reproducible in your practice and consistent because in the office-based setting where I did my 26 years, uh, a rapid emergence and discharge is really critical. Uh, this, this clip has been seen over 200,000 times on YouTube. I'm very proud of it. And we're gonna see the only sound on here is the sound of the pulse oximeter, which doesn't change. And you'll see that the patient doesn't require any instrumentation or anybody's hand on their chin to support their airway. Here is that the red area, EMG, will start to decrease before the yellow, the this monitor. And here's Dr. Lin. Yeah. I didn't realize you're so tall. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when like, Tom's right. standing. I'm going right now. I feel it. Hopefully it feels pleasant. It's pleasant. Mm -hmm. It's like my ideal way to die, but I mean, <laughs> well, we, we tend not to do that. I'm like 106, you know? Yeah. I want my dog by my side, though. Mm -hmm. What kind of, what kind of, yeah, a Roddy. 
Uh, well, I'm a daughter too, but. So. Alright, here we go. So this young lady is a nice young lady. Will I be twitching? No, no twitching. Just I might be gassy because I didn't eat, but. Yeah, that's okay. We don't charge extra for gassiness. I'm feeling a little drunk. Mm -hmm. well, it's pleasant though, isn't it? It's a drunk feeling. Yeah. So I might say, I'm sorry staff, but I might mm -hmm. say shit that I don't know. Yeah. You would say. <laughs> Just don't worry, you know, I haven't had food since 10, so. Yes, this fortunately nice this little feeling. video doesn't have a, doesn't have audio in it, it's just the video, so. Please don't mind my dry mouth. It's okay. This is a nice feeling. Isn't that nice? Now you know why everybody likes Dr. Freakley. And when I hear honking, I know to eat. Yes. Um, how do immediate? Immediately. Okay, so I have nice and good porridge. Mm -hmm. If I wake up and marry an anesthesiologist, mm -hmm. I eat, right? Yep. How many, how many, okay. um, how many uh, chances to, to the I got both. I got her and I got the biz in the, in the frame. Super. Perfect. That's great. You can stop now. So I'm not sure that doing things this way it absolutely requires the services of board certified anesthesiologist. I'd love to be able to find fuller employment for my colleagues, but I know that there are nurse anesthetists. Some people have used respiratory therapists or uh, emergency uh, medical uh, service, EMS, paramedics to watch the airway and titrate the propofol. But like I said before, when you're titrating with the EMG as well as the biz, it's like an open book test. It's like cheating. And then we get to the lady who was incredibly sensitive. Turned out she was an Eastern European Jewish anesthesiologist. And when I told her we were going to give her propofol, she said, propofol, oi vey, the last time they gave me propofol, I slept for two days. And I'm thinking, okay, lady, you're telling me you're sensitive, but how sensitive could she possibly be? Well, in all the time I had been doing this approach, I'd never turn the maintenance rate below 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Like I said in the previous slide, we start at 25 mics per kilo per minute as a base rate and creep up in, in a calculus sort of fashion to get to where you wanted to go, which was spontaneous ventilation, room air, over 94 uh, set. So here she is, and what happened, I used the same 50 microgram per kilogram in successive boluses, even for the most sensitive patient, and she never stopped breathing and never lost her airway. But I had to progressively reduce from 25 to 20 to 15, and the first time I did this, I chickened out at 2.5, and then I learned that 2 was probably okay. And when you see this, actually, she might have even gone as low as 1.5. Otherwise, healthy 60-kilogram woman. Let's see if we can get this to look good for you here. Can you hear the uh, pulse oximeter? Yes. Okay. Well, there's the rate. There's her body weight. And she's having a facelift, I believe. And this is in the era of uh, mandated end tidal CO2, which is the bottom curve here. And so to do that, I use a nasopharyngeal airway and I use the uh, nasal prongs. And uh, in one limb, I measured the, uh, I administered the oxygen. The other limb, I, uh, you're having a lot of fun here with this. <laughs> Dr. Duplachain, if you tell your colleagues that Dr. Friedberg successfully anesthetized somebody for a four-hour case at two mics per kilogram per minute of propofol, they're going to say, nah, that doesn't exist. It doesn't happen. 
trust me, you know, I, I looked at one of my older lectures and I didn't have quite as much experience. I said, well, there's a 60 fold variation. As I got more experience, sooner or later you run across these people and you can only imagine what a nightmare it would be to try to get them to wake up and go home from your office facility if you're giving them 25 mics or more per kilo per minute. Okay. Dr. Yeah, yes. Dr. Freeberg, while we're, I'm, I'm gonna just ask you this question now because it's certainly on mine. So what, what's what's the reason? I mean, I'm, this is what it's it's distributed. It's metabolized by the liver. It, is this an enzyme problem, or is this just human variation? Or what's why why is it such a wide range? Have you been able to figure that out? The only thing I can figure out is by measuring. You're able to observe. You don't have to know why. You only have to know that I cannot give this woman what I would normally give 25 to 50 mics per kilo per minute for a four hour facelift and expect her to wake up and go home in any kind of reasonable fashion. If I wanted to keep her for a day or two in the office, you know, I would do that, but it would be a real challenge. So in the old days, before we could measure the brain response, we would think about, you know, liver metabolism, redistribution, but really has nothing to do with it. The whole issue is how sensitive is her brain? And her mm -hmm. brain is so sensitive that she's almost off the bell curve. She's not the 10%, she's at the one tenth of 1% sensitivity. And I've had okay. three of those patients. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, so maintaining the airway while you're using the incremental uh, technique allows you to keep the muscles that normally preserve the airway patent. And so, Typically, I start off with the right tidectomy uh, position, which is chin up and lateral rotation. And if that's not enough to keep the airway open, we put an unheated IV bag under the shoulders, not the neck, to increase the force of extension on the genial glosses. And the reason I don't routinely instrument the airway in my cosmetic, this is fascinating. <laughs> okay, where do we go here? The reason I don't routinely uh, instrument the patients is that most of my work was done before end tidal CO2 uh, was mandated. And so I was able to do most of them with room air spontaneous ventilation and avoid any complaints of post-operative uh, soreness in the throat. As you all know, the cosmetic surgery patient will complain about just about anything, a uh, painful IV start or a sore throat. Uh, you know, you've done a great job for your surgery, but they're unhappy because they have a sore throat. So that was the motivation I had to avoid instrumenting the airway on a routine basis. Now I will tell you the only time I routinely insert a laryngeal mask airway, and it's the flexible one, is for uh, rhinoplasty. And so that allows me to tape the LMA to the chin and allow the surgeon a direct visual access to do his procedure. So as far as ketamine hallucinations go, I was really excited in 1993 to find out that my hypothesis that sleep doses of propofol blocked ketamine hallucinations, that I published it, but the anesthesia literature, surprisingly enough, wasn't interested in this information one little bit. And so after two journals, two major journals turned it down, I said, well, let's try plastic and reconstructive surgery. I published this and they said, well, that's great. I feel really good about publishing, but nobody in anesthesia, virtually nobody in anesthesia reads the plastic surgery literature. If they read it, they wouldn't believe it. And that's especially true when we get to the subject of lidocaine toxicity and dosage. And so that was my first 25 cases in the first publication. And the second publication was my first 50 cases. So there's really been no issue of hallucinations, hypertension or tachycardia, which is the classical teaching of ketamine uh, since using the propofol uh, technique. Now, post-operative nausea and vomiting is a very interesting subject. Uh, probably few, few surgeries uh, as much as rhytidectomy and abdominoplasty are uh, where, where patients throwing up and retching is really going to be an issue. And so, as my friend and one of my early converts to propofol ketamine, uh, Chris Pollock in Hull, England said, well, you know, if you want patients to stop throwing up, stop giving them drugs and make them sick to their stomach. And so the problem for us in anesthesia is the unspoken catechism is that surgery is painful, opioids are painkillers, and therefore all surgery requires the judicious use of opioids. I mean, in all fairness, for my first 15 years of practice, never once did I consider not giving opioids. That's just what we do. And so the hardest task for most cosmetic surgeons, and, and 
other surgeons is to pry their anesthesiologist's hands off the, the fentanyl syringe. At least 50% of all patient, papers are never cited by letter, later authors, and actually it's over 230 later papers and 70 textbook chapters. As Dr. Duplachain was kind enough to say, Miller's Anesthesia, the number one textbook worldwide, has my 1999 paper cited. And uh, this was an astonishing and unprecedented 0.6% post-op nausea and vomiting rate. These are opioid-free patients in an aptful to find high-risk population without using antiemetics. Now, Christian Apfel published his uh, four famous uh, characteristics in the New England Journal of Medicine, making him a very extraordinary anesthesiologist. And when he published this, I reached out to him. I said, hey, Chris, you're talking about my patients. My cosmetic patients are exactly that. They are non-smoking females, typically with histories of nausea and vomiting or motion sickness, having what he called a metagenic surgery. Cosmetic surgery is considered to be an emetogenic surgery. And in this, this uh, chapter, he said, as long as emetogenic agents are part of the anesthetic regimen, the use of antiemetics is of limited utility. So when you go to the consensus guideline, guidelines my colleagues published and then republished, talking about the risk factors, Apple's risk factors, uh, with each additional risk factor, you add another antiemetic. And here I've given no antiemetics in a high-risk population and had an unprecedented 0.6% uh, PONV rate. So to me, the answer is pretty obvious. If you don't want patients to stop throwing up, stop fooling around with antiemetics and stop giving opioids. Ketamine-associated laryngospasm, I have to tell you, is a very distressing phenomenon because I, I, in the early days, I gave over 100 cases before I... I saw my first experience and I wasn't really exactly sure what it was until I put the face mask on the patient and tried to uh, do anterior jaw displacement and positive pressure ventilation. And it was like trying to ventilate the wall, it, nothing. And the problem is that the cords slam entirely shut. So the reason that most, ketamine, uh, most uh, laryngospasm is recognized is that the cords don't close entirely. There's a small uh, opening and the high-pitched crowing sound that every first-year medical student can recognize uh, is there. And so the prodrome for ketamine-associated laryngospasm is a cough or a sneeze. That's all you're going to see. You're not going to hear any crowing. And the mm -hmm. treatment is one milligram per pound, not per kilogram, one milligram per pound IV lidocaine push. And I published this finally in uh, 2020. Bronchospasm is something you typically will see when you irritate the, uh, the trachea. And since I don't use endotracheal tubes, I've not seen any bronchospasm in 26 years and over 6,000 patients. But should you find some other cause of bronchospasm, the use of ketamine is, uh, is pretty good in terms of bronchodilatation. Lidocaine toxicity, you know, everybody in anesthesia says three and a half milligrams per kilogram without epinephrine and seven milligrams per kilogram uh, with epinephrine. But virtually nobody in anesthesia receives any education about tumescent anesthesia. Dr. Klein is one of my uh, local neighbors here in Orange County, and uh, I understand that he's increased his, uh, his notion. He split the difference with Dr. Ostad, and he now says 45 milligrams per kilogram. With lidocaine is okay and also he published 28 milligrams per kilogram so in california we say don't use more than five liters of uh, tumescent fluid for liposuction florida has a four liter limit uh, it's not that you can't use more uh, but complications start to rise uh, so basically staying out of trouble is the better part of valor Lidocaine toxicity. Well, if you're breathing room air and you start to see some signs of lidocaine toxicity, supplemental oxygen is certainly a good idea. Uh, and signs are typically uh, widening of the QRS complex and hypotension, uh, blood pressure support with epinephrine. And intralipid is, is something that I've not had occasion to use with lidocaine because lidocaine doesn't bind to the cardiac muscle nearly to the degree that bupivacaine does. And so... Uh, I've just not seen, I had the one case of lidocaine toxicity where they were using, they thought they were using half percent uh, 
lidocaine and in fact they were using 2% lidocaine and uh, it was a very frightening experience but they, we were able to, able to salvage the patient and he got discharged from the hospital the next day after being ventilated and overnight. As far as the use of a lipid, uh, <clears throat> intralipid for anesthesia toxicity, again, when you see this, they're talking about bupivacaine related cardiac arrest. And the dose is um, 1.5 milligram per kilogram bolus over a minute, and then a quarter milligram uh, per kilogram per minute over 10 minutes until the patient stabilized. Like I say, mercifully, I only had the, the one thing. And it was interesting because uh, this was uh, before I was using, before I knew about the EMG, and it was sometime in early 1998. And the biz keeps going down, and I keep dialing back on the propofol, and it keeps going down, 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 and I keep titrating back on the propofol. Mm -hmm. And finally, the biz is zero, and the, the propofol is zero. And I say, well, guys, call 911. <laughs> button the patient up, I, I intubated him, I hung a, an epinephrine drip and rode to hospital to, to transport him. And uh, I, I'm not sure how that mistake was made, but in retrospect, that's, that's what it was. So again, uh, prevention is the better part of valor. Myocardial infarction is near and dear to my heart because I started my training at Stanford in cardiac anesthesia. And the simple fact is that with coronary artery disease, the Disease coronary arteries can't dilate to provide a greater supply of oxygen when the heart rate goes up. So the way to stay out of trouble is to avoid tachycardia or heart rates above 100 beats per minute. Uh, my treatment has always been labetalol, 10 milligrams, but again, this assumes you have no opioids on board. Uh, for those who continue to use opioids, five milligrams uh, is the recommended dose repeated as needed to keep the heart rate from going above 100. What you may see is an acute current of injury and hypotension, and this is the time to be calling 911 for a stat hospital transfer because managing an acute cardiac uh, in myocardial infarction is just not the province of office-based anesthesia. So in conclusion, staying out of trouble is the greater wisdom for getting out than getting out of trouble. Measuring is better than guessing. And even Warren Buffett agrees. He says it's much easier to stay out of trouble now than to get out of trouble later. So I'm ready for questions. I know this came a little bit short, but I'm good to go. And uh, hopefully uh, we can roll through and see what other people want to know. Dr. Freeberg, thank you so much. That was that was great for being so transparent and sharing a lot of your life's work with us. And, and you know, we can see how, how passionate you are about it. So I'm looking in the chat box. Do we have any questions or? Can you hear me? Can, can anybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Barry, yes. I, you know, I just want to say that uh, I have a collection of friends in my life, many of them. Uh, Kevin Dupashane is one of them right here and some other people on this call, but that are just so passionate about what they do. And it is not a job. It's become their life's work. And, uh, you know, you're a pretty amazing guy. And uh, I, I appreciate it. You've you've always been really good to AACS and the cosmetic surgeons, and uh, you always have a good message here. Um, so I, I really appreciate you you being on there. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, uh, Doc, I got a question for you here. One of the one of the attendees wants to know what do you do with patients that are on psychotropic medications? Uh, psychotropics meaning uh, SSRIs, antidepressants, or, or uh, um, they they I'll let them respond maybe to that, and then I can. Uh, it, it doesn't say it's a psychotropic, but maybe um, let, we can get that. Let me um, say this. I, let me say this: that you can ask all you want about uh, marijuana use or LSD use or any other type of drug which may be consciousness altering. And they'll deny it. They just they just typically won't tell you, right? And so the way you have the advantage is you're going to measure and you're going to go slowly and you'll adjust the dose according to whatever has, whatever perturbation, whatever drugs they're taking may or may not have influenced. Now, I understand uh, not psychotropic, but Ozempic has some unfortunate uh, complications with anesthesia. 
Uh, I haven't seen it because it, Ozempic wasn't around when I was practicing. But again, the whole idea of incremental induction is to stay out of trouble. You know, when you can induce somebody like I showed you, that woman who only took, I mean, a, a homeopathic dose of propofol at two mics per kilo per minute, when you can induce somebody like that with 50 microgram per kilogram progressive bolus, you're going to stay out of trouble because they're going to tell you as you start to induce them if there's an issue. And so whether it's psychotropic or diet medication or illicit drugs, the advantage you have... They were asking about SSRIs, they said in the chat box. Right. Okay. Well, it hasn't been a problem in my practice. It doesn't mean it can't be a problem, but I haven't seen it as a problem. And uh, I don't know what else I can say. Uh, again, measuring is better than guessing. And uh, I mean, I just, for 20 years before I had the processed EEG monitor, I got to be a pretty good guesser. But really, I like an open book test a whole lot better because you know exactly what's going on in real time with that patient. And, you know, people will say, well, gosh, Dr. Friedberg, the monitor's so expensive and this and that. But, you know, it's compared to the value it gives you in terms of peace of mind to know it doesn't matter who this patient is on that bell curve you're only going to give them exactly what they want. That's the reason I call it Goldilocks anesthesia, because if you're dosing them based on the number from their forehead, not their body weight or heart rate and blood pressure, you're only going to give just the right amount, not too much and not too little. I thought the use of Goldilocks was such a clever shorthand until I ran into a large Hispanic population. And finally, one of the nurses said, oh, Dr. Friedberg, we know that story, but we only know her as Rositos de Oro, the gold-haired one. Oh, and of course, the Asian patients and the Indian patients, they don't know the story at all. So although I thought I had a very clever shorthand, it didn't turn out to be that clever. I don't mind explaining that to them. The other thing I found with the cosmetic surgery patient, and I didn't know this when I first started for the first two years, I couldn't understand when I put the patient, the sensor on the patient's forehead, why they would say, ouch. And then I went to a meeting once and they put one on my forehead. I said, oh gosh, yeah, that, that's really not nice. So how come the company doesn't tell you that? So after that, I showed the sensor to the patient and I let them touch the scratchy part that goes on their forehead. And I say, I can't puncture skin with that, right? If I can't puncture skin with that, I'm not gonna scar your face. So that was the end of that objection. And it, it was really just marvelous after that. But, you know, it's these little simple things like, you know, putting a little buffered lidocaine in the skin before an IV. You know, just the little things that make a world of difference for patients who are already pretty high on the anxious scale uh, coming for cosmetic surgery. So there's another question. Um, would you feel comfortable just commenting on the device that you use? Would you care to share the name? Uh, I know you said you had no no conflicts with that. Someone's asking about the device. The device is called the Bispectral Index Monitor, BIS. And uh, I bought my BIS, I believe on, well, I bought it from the company, but you can get a pretty good deal on eBay. You just have to be sure, you, you see, I don't know if you can see this or not, with my sensor, there's a, that looks like a hockey puck. And a, there's, so there's three parts to the thing. There's the, the device itself, the part that goes to the hockey puck, and then the patient interface cable, the PIC cable. So as long as you get all three parts from eBay, that's great. And you can buy the sensors there also for half price. When they come, it says, you know, it's expired, but if you put it on and, and push the button, they work just fine. So in terms of you know, if you're really trying to save a buck, you can go to eBay, but I don't have a, 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 any stake in the game, and I certainly don't know anything about Cetasis and, and, and uh, Sedline and uh, Cetasis. Uh, okay, entropy. great. There was also a question about uh, dosing with, you know, with marijuana being so readily available and, and right. being prescribed now. Right. Um, how would you comment on that? Well, unless they're acutely intoxicated, you know, it's, it's the same issue as any drug. You're just going to start slowly and adjust according to the patient's response. And like I say, it actually becomes a really neat. There was a, a, a TV show, a detective show that starts with the song, Who Are You? You know, and so that's really what you want to know when you're sedating the patient. Who is this patient on the bell curve? Are they, uh, you know, an average patient? 
Are they a lightweight or are they a heavyweight? And they're going to tell you. And the marijuana history doesn't seem to make any difference. Like I say, you can ask them till the cows come home and they're going to deny it. Or even if they say the whole basis of safety, again, is measuring and going slowly. It makes it very, very hard to mess it up. And it really, it becomes, it becomes a very joyful experience because nobody's going to fake you out. <laughs> what comes off the forehead is, is where the action is. So marijuana, LSD, psilocybin, any of those drugs, they may produce some effect, but whatever effect they're going to produce, you're going to see the effect that the propofol is producing and adjust accordingly. So if they need more, they get more. If they need less, they get less. It's uh, it's a complete it's a complete change in how we give patients medication. The other thing I was going to say is people often ask about midazolam and amnesia, and it turns out when you're measuring the propofol with a processed EEG monitor, the propofol is a perfectly good amnestic. So in that 20 years with over 4,000 patients, there hasn't been a single case of awareness and recall. So there's really no reason to give midazolam other than force of habit. Typically, you find anesthesiologists like to give two milligrams of midazolam and two cc's or 100 micrograms of fentanyl to start every case. And there's absolutely no reason to do that. Um, and where does the bis where does the bis need to be to have no no recollection? Sixty to seventy five, moderate to deep sedation. Okay, I have a really um, it's a complex question, um, so I'm going to ask you, um, and if, if need be, I'm happy to try to re repeat it. Um, so you know the the participant says thank you so much for the explanation of this and, and the variability in patient response if the propofol. They are actually uh, looking at a case where a, a patient received 97 and a half micrograms per kilogram per minute of propofol for three hours, during which they had no airway intervention, no problems, along with 50 milligrams of ketamine and 10 micrograms of fentanyl. So uh, an expert for uh, the plaintiff, for the patient, was hospitalized for a surgical site bleed and had no anesthesia-related problems has claimed that in itself the dose of propofol indicated, so that's the 97.5, that the patient was under general, general anesthesia. What are your general thoughts on a case like this? And um, just more about the standard of care, do you consider that a general anesthetic at that dose? I'm assuming there was no biz monitor or other processed EEG monitor, so they could actually show what that 97.5 micrograms per kilogram was doing. Would that be correct? I'm going to say that I don't have that information. The 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 the, the participant might respond to that for me, um, but right now I'm going to say no. Okay. Well, if you're not measuring but you're titrating incrementally, uh, that's at least deep sedation. Uh, but it's very hard to define, as you can see, if there's a hundredfold variation in how much propofol patients need to get to the same level, numerical level of sedation, then 97.5 might be biz of 65 or 70 in a, in a resistant patient. Clearly, in my experience, at that level, you have a patient who's very resistant. Not and, and for me, the other issue is once you give a systemic analgetic, now you're treading in a very funny place. You know, a lot of times people will say there's a little Mac and Big Mac, you know, which means Big Mac is an intravenous general anesthetic. But it doesn't sound like there was an issue of anesthetic harm. So, you know, you can get an expert witness to, to testify. Yeah, they think that's excessive. But, you know, again, if you're not measuring, how do you know that this is not the patient, like I said here, that required, you know, as much as I had patients this, who were at this level of sedation. Yes, it certainly wouldn't be something that anyone could say is unsafe based on your work of 200 to two, right? Right, exactly. And, and the fact yeah. that the, the saturation was good and spontaneous ventilation was good. I mean, yeah. I don't see that as a general anesthetic by definition of the dose only. You see, okay. without right. the response, you don't really know that, but the fact that they're breathing spontaneously with a decent sat suggests that we're not in general anesthesia territory. Okay, that's good. That's a good, that's a great response. I think that's that's going to be helpful. Thank you. Um, 
Any other questions, guys? Anything? Um, we had some nice chat questions, and your explanations were, were superb and very helpful, I think, for everybody. Um, Thank you. So if you were, I, I'm going to ask you this. If, 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 if tomorrow morning I walk in, in my anesthesiology group and say, hey, guys, I want to try this great new technique that's been around for 27 years, how do you introduce that to, you know, um, other other practitioners that might find this um, not not might not be as familiar with this technique. I mean, okay. refer them to your work, but how do you introduce this to them? The first thing is don't try to introduce it on the morning of surgery. I, I have the same issue when anesthesiologists ask me the same question of how would I get the surgeon to play this new game? You know, this is like a video game. Uh, so you want to talk to them in a non incipient situation say, come over for a glass of wine, go out for a cup of coffee, you're not in the operating room, we're not thinking about well, what am I gonna be challenged with today? So immediately you set the stage, it's more collegial. And it's not like, I'm gonna tell you how to do your work, even though you're a board certified anesthesiologist. No, no. So this is what I would like to try, and I want you to humor me. I'd like to try 10 or 20 cases this way and if you don't like it and you're uncomfortable with it, we'll just go back and do what you want to do. But, you know, when you put them in the situation they're about to give an anesthetic, all of a sudden, you know, why do I want to do something I'm not familiar with, I'm not comfortable with? And, you know, if they don't know about how to use the biz, you know, if you ask them about, have you used the biz training the EMG? And they kind of look at you and say, what? No, we only have a single trace on the biz and, you know, it's like driving the car with the rear view mirror. So if you approach people in a collegial fashion and you say things like, well, look, these are my cases. I want you to humor me for 10 or 20 cases. OK, and if you like it, we'll continue to do it. Uh, when my wife had some uh, breast implant surgery uh, replacement uh, a year or so ago, the surgeon was willing to do it. The anesthesiologist was willing to do it. And as she's wide awake in recovery and they, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon keep coming and well, we never seen anything like this. You would think this might be a force for change. And when I asked him later on follow up, no, we're not doing it. We just, it was nice. Thank you. I, mean, I don't know how much better you can do. So the point is changing people's practice is the most difficult thing you can possibly do. For instance, when I tell you, Dr. Duplachain, that vasoconstriction is no guarantee of adequate analgesia. That's why I have this slide up here. If you see patient movement in this area, that means whatever movement is being generated is not coming from the cortex, which means this is not movement that's associated with awareness or recall. If on the other hand, you see movement like this, this means Give more propofol and make the curve come back down. And so what happens is you don't see heart rate and blood pressure changes when you do this. This becomes a virtual video game and it engages the anesthesiologist in a way that it's very hard to duplicate because now they actually have a dynamic reason to be following the case. Many surgeons say, God, I can't get the guys to pay attention to what I'm doing. You know, they're reading this or they're, you know, they're on their phone or whatever. But if you're glued to this and you respond to this EMG spike as if it was a heart rate or blood pressure change, man, everything changes. And it really, it, it's, it's fun to give an anesthetic. And when you say something, fun to give an anesthetic? No, I'm just here to do a camera. So you may not succeed in changing them, but if you show them, what it is you'd like to try and you ask them to do to humor you to say how about 10 to 20 cases and we'll assess the outcomes uh, like i say the surgeon and anesthesiologist kept coming to my wife and her gurney and they had eyes like this said, we never seen anything like this right i mean patients when i saw those first 50 cases of mine in 1992 who got no narcotics and woke up not sick to their stomach, not in pain, and didn't look like they'd just been traumatized by surgery, it was my OMG WTF moment. I said, all that teaching about using narcotics was a lie. We didn't prevent pain using narcotics. And I've often said the function, post-operative pain is a function of intraoperative pain. 
And what that 50 milligrams of ketamine does three minutes before you do the injection is the patient's brain does not perceive the bodily invasion of the surgeon. Furthermore, the internal pain fibers have no reason to go on high alert because, again, it's a non-event. Oh, okay. But yeah, postoperative pain as a function of intraoperative pain is almost as shocking as when I try to tell the surgeon that vasoconstriction does not guarantee adequate analgesia. It only takes one little skin fiber to, to, to generate some spinal cord a generated movement. And so once you have this objective evidence of what the heck is going on when you're trying to figure out why is this patient moving? 98 to 99 percent of the time if you re-inject the immediate area you knock out that little fiber and the patient lies still. Instead of saying oh my god the patient's waking up you got to give deeper anesthetic. Deeper anesthesia doesn't help because pain can be perceived even at deep general anesthesia. So the trick is to fool the brain. And by using that local anesthesia that you always use because you want the vasoconstriction for hemostasis, you prolong the period of time before the patient's brain figures out, hey, we've been invaded, <laughs> okay? And so the degree of analgesia required postoperatively is easily managed with extra strength Tylenol or extra strength Tylenol plus ibuprofen. Uh, I used to use uh, uh, Keterolac, 15 to 30 milligrams. Uh, 45 minutes before the end of the case. I mean, it just, but my first five years, I didn't use any antiemetics. I didn't do anything tricky as far as, you know, adding Keterolac or, or, or giving clonidine as a premedication. It's just as simple as possible. You just put the patient to sleep incrementally with the propofol. You give the 50 milligrams of ketamine. Surgeon puts the local and does the case and you carry the, prop the propofol. I mean, it's what I call minimally invasive anesthesia. Did I answer yeah, the question or I go off on a tangent? No, I think that's a really good discussion about why local anesthetic for us helps in a, in a lot of situations. And I think we've all seen that where you, you think you've infiltrated everything and there's one little hot spot, as we like to call it, that when you put the when you put a little local in, nobody has to change anything else. So I have another question for you. Uh, sure. This may be our last question for this evening. Um, so is there any procedure or a combination of cosmetic procedures that would that you feel would require general anesthetic instead of this technique? Uh, I, uh, not in my experience. I mean, I, I've done full body liposuctions. I've done mommy makeover, breast augmentation with abdominoplasty. Uh, I've done uh, facelift with breast aug together. Uh, I just... I've not seen a reason to use general anesthesia other than the fact that the guys that you're working with are most familiar with general anesthesia and most comfortable yeah. giving it. That's the main indication, not, not the procedural indication. Again, you know, working with the surgeon and the anesthesiologist, you have a comfortable relationship. You're happy doing what you do. And all I can say is this is what I've done and this is why I do it. And these are the outcomes that, you know, the most, the two most un common reasons for unexpected admission to the hospital after day surgery are post-op pain and post-op nausea and vomiting. And for my entire series of 26 years and over 6,000 patients, all of whom had commercial insurance to cover that need, not even one patient was admitted to hospital after surgery. Most of them went home within an hour, even the abdominoplasty patients, and they didn't require a professional aftercare giver to watch them when they went home. People just, how can this possibly be? The thing about local anesthesia I'd like to close with is you know that there are some of our colleagues out there who are playing on patients' fears of anesthesia and say, we can do any cosmetic procedure under local anesthesia alone. So given that as a start in 1992, I said to myself, well, between wide awake local anesthesia and full general anesthesia with an tracheal tube and muscle relaxant, how much do we have to trespass on an elective cosmetic surgery patient to give the surgeon good operating conditions and expose the patient to the least amount of risk? And so for me, moderate to deep sedation with propofol ketamine local anesthesia seems to fit the bill. Uh, patients, most patients don't really want to be there when their sur surgery is going on. Most surgeons have already done enough talking to the patient to get them to commit to surgery. They'd really prefer not to be discussing the case while they're doing it with, with the surgeon. And so that's kind of where I am. I, I just don't see, for me, 
the risk, however small the risk of malignant hyperthermia is, I don't see that as an acceptable risk for an elective cosmetic case. Uh, I know that dantrolene is there, and you know there was a very tragic case in Florida of an 18-year-old girl who was adopted, didn't have a family history, uh, develops malignant hyperthermia, and they only had two ampules of propofol, not even a, a loading dose, and somehow the Florida Medical Board thought that was okay. Uh, mm. Wow. You know, yeah. they got into some airway issue. They gave some succinylcholine under general anesthesia. Boom, malignant hyperthermia. So it's extremely rare. But the point is, if you're giving general anesthesia, you not only have to stock the dantrolene, you have to do MH drills, just like uh, CPR drills, you know. And it's just one more thing. They said the other problem with, with general anesthesia is the issue of scavenging. You can no longer just dump those exhaust gases out into the atmosphere. It's just one more layer of complexity for doing cases that you didn't need the general anesthesia in the first place, except if that's the only way they want to give general anesthesia, they, they, they're comfortable giving. And I don't blame them because they don't teach sedation in, in, in the residency programs. You know, kind of like if you have a, a straight surgical ENT uh, uh, residency, they're not teaching rhytidectomies and rhinoplasties, they're teaching sinus surgery, right? And uh, yeah, other no, sorts of medical. Right. So yeah. to me, there's a real difference between medically indicated surgery, which is have to surgery, and elective cosmetic surgery, which is want to surgery. Uh, I mean, this, I think that, you know, some of the things that just are so attractive about this is just, that, like you said, almost a total lack of, of, uh, of nausea after surgery. I mean, that, that, that can be a real heartache for, for the patient, for the doctor, for the staff trying to send somebody home or having to admit them because they're nauseated and they can't go home or they throw up in the middle of the night and right. get an orbital hematoma, just all of the things that we all absolutely want to avoid. So I'm sure that there'll be a lot of interest in this and, um, you know, uh, Dr. Freeberg was kind enough to, to share a lot of that with us. I suggest that you just maybe get his book and take a look at it. It's, I think it's downloadable. Uh, is that right, Barry? I don't really know. I think, I think so. The interesting thing is 16 years after publication, people are still buying the book. And the only yeah. thing, the only thing I would change. That's because my picture's on it. <laughs> I thought you were giving it away because Joe's picture was on it. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the only thing I would change in a secondary edition is in the in the clinical pathway, it says 150 mics per kilo uh, of propofol. And I would have just taken the 100 off and say, start with 50 mics per kilo. That that okay. was the, the outgrowth of dental sedation, where you don't want to be sitting there trying to mask ventilate somebody who's going to have dental work. I mean, so I said, well, how much lower can I go to make sure that, that I don't lose the airway and the patient keeps breathing? And I, you know, just as empirically, you know, I started with whatever. Uh, when I started doing this, I started with Vinix 75 milligram uh, initial dose of ketamine and had a few patients wake up with horizontal nystagmus. I said, gee, that, maybe that's just too much ketamine. And I empirically tried 50 milligrams and that seemed to work. But because I was curious, I tried 25 milligrams instead of 50 to see if maybe less is better, being a minimalist. And it turned out four out of five patients lay still for the local anesthetic injection. But then I had to stop the surge and say, let me give the other 25. So bottom line, there's no real downside to the 50 milligrams once you have the patient asleep. If you're not using a biz, you can use loss of lid reflex and loss of verbal response uh, before you give the ketamine to set the stage for motion, immobile, uh, immobility to local anesthetic injection. Okay, well, that's the last tip for the evening, I think, but we, we certainly want to thank you. It was a pleasure kind of getting to know you before. I know we had a chance to speak before and a couple of days ago. and. Uh, I mean, this is obviously your life's work and something that I think we all benefit from. So thank you for sharing all of this with us. I want to remind everyone that if you registered for this and you had to um, scoot out a little early or you want to go back and pick up some pieces, this is all recorded and will be in the Academy's Learning Library. And I think it's available for 90 days. So um, if you're looking for some extra information, you can log into the AACS and go to the Learning Library and take a look at this. And beyond that, um, you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And Dr. Freeberg, any final comments before we go? Yes, all my, all my, most of my papers are on open access research gate and my other opioid free anesthesia lectures are on my YouTube channel. So uh, 
There's lots of information there, but basically it's an extremely simple approach. And I will conclude with simplicity confounds those who are Im imbued with complexity. You know, when people come and watch me in the, in the operating room, they see three syringes on the back table as opposed to the usual eight to 15. They say, how can you possibly give anesthesia like this? I said, well, I don't know. I've been doing it this way for 26 years and it seems to work and patients seem to like it. And, you know, the happiness from propofol is a real plus when you're dealing with a cosmetic surgery patient who's looking to improve their happiness with body, body alteration. Wake up with a clean slate, right? Absolutely. Very good. Okay. Okay. Um, how do we do the CME here? There's a certificate that you'll get mailed. Reed, are you still on? You want to explain that? Yes, I am. Yeah. So um, what you do is you just fill out the evaluation and CME claim form. You need to do that to get your CME. And, and then you're going to send that? Email notifying you that your CME certificate is available. How do we get the form? Um, it should be in your inbox um, right now, actually. Okay. Very good. All right, see you, everybody. Thank you. So good to all see right, all the names and faces of everyone, and I look forward to seeing everyone in New Orleans. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Enjoy Bye -bye. the rest of your evening. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thank you.